The following is a special podcast presented by PD Avengers and supported by Abbott. All right, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for this very special webinar, Choosing DBS, a deep dive into real patient experiences with the Liberta RC DBS system. I'm Larry Gifford, your host today, and someone deeply involved in the Parkinson's community. I was diagnosed in 2017. I had DBS last October. Uh, the purpose of today's session is to provide a comprehensive look at deep brain stimulation. You'll hear firsthand from two patients, Ed McQuaid and Margaret Cohen, about their journey to DBS and how it's really positively impacted their lives. We'll also hear expert insights from Dr. Mitesh Lodia, a movement disorder specialist, to answer some of the most common questions and misconceptions about DBS. Our goal today is to offer education, reassurance, and inspiration. We want you to leave with a clearer understanding of what DBS can offer and how it might make a difference in your or a loved one's life. Let me introduce our speakers, Ed McQuaid, diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2018, chose to undergo DBS surgery earlier this year. Ed, thanks for being here. Oh, glad to be here. Margaret Collin, diagnosed in 2015. You're going to share how you uh, overcame concerns and embraced the possibilities of DBS and everything it has to offer. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us. And Dr. Mitesh Lotia, a movement disorder specialist who practices out of Orlando, Florida, will provide a clinical perspective on DBS therapy and why it can be a life-changing option for some patients. Hello, all. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you for being here. I just put into the chat, what is your biggest concern about DBS? Love to get your thoughts on that as we go through the webinar. All right, let's start with you, Dr. Lotia. DBS is a well-established therapy used to manage symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but medications alone aren't enough but it's not a cure. That correct? is correct. Yes, that is correct. So uh, let's talk about the basics, you know, uh, of the DBS. So yes, it's been uh, available as a therapy for more than 20 years, but it's still unfortunate that often people still don't know about it. And therefore, again, I really appreciate uh, folks like Larry and our uh, Abbott partners to create this sort of awareness. Um, so I just want to start with that. But DBS is, think of that as uh, one more ammunition to improve your quality of life in your Parkinson's journey. Um, yes, it is not a cure, but this is how I divide as to which patients are good candidates for the DBS. So I kind of categorize them into three categories. Uh, number one, people with Parkinson's who have really bad tremors. And we've tried their medications, we've uh, tried optimizing their medications, and no matter what you do, the tremors do not get better. Uh, and the DBS then helps those patients. Then we have patients who are in the mid stages of their Parkinson's journey. Well, the medications were working well in the beginning. Now they started having problems where medications are not providing that predictable response and uh, life is becoming more unpredictable. And also then sometimes we are having developing some more of those dance-like movements, the dyskinesias. So those are the patients who are also ideal for the deep brain stimulation surgery. And the third, usually that's a much lesser uh, uh, grown population, but patients who are still like, uh, they have Parkinson's, we established that they respond very well to medications. It's just that no matter what they do, they have side effects from the medication optimization. And again, they have motor symptoms that bother them. So these are the three sort of categories of patients that are good candidates for the DBS. So what is the DBS? So deep brain stimulation, as the name implies, we are stimulating specific deeper parts of the brain. As we all understand, Parkinson's disease is a network problem and there are abnormal network connections. So the idea is to intercept somewhere in the middle of that network and draw, overdrive that area so that you can sort of try to normalize uh, some of those networks and try to improve some symptoms of the Parkinson's. Um, so it's, a, uh, it's an invasive brain surgery which involves uh, you know, uh, drilling a small hole uh, into the skull. I always say it's into the skull, not into the brain. Uh, mm -hmm. So a small hole into the skull and then inserting a very, very small wire. Uh, and I have that one to show. 
Um, so you can see this is how the wire looks like. This is basically what kind of sits inside. Um, this area goes into the skull and you can hopefully see that better. Um, let's see, so this has the lead and uh, then it has, all these are the electrodes uh, that are basically stimulating uh, different areas in the brain and then the rest of them Oh, you muted yourself, Dr. Lapia. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so then basically it runs behind the ear, uh, of course, underneath the skin and kind of runs under the neck and usually sits on either side of the chest uh, with a uh, and connects to a battery pack. This is one of the most recent or new um, Abbott battery pack uh, that is the rechargeable Liberta battery. And it's a very small device. It's the smallest uh, rechargeable battery. And that's what sits in the chest. And the idea is when you stimulate or when you turn on this, uh, it sends the electrical signals to a very specific area of the brain. And slowly as we increase the stimulation, uh, some of the symptoms of uh, Parkinson's uh, improve uh, drastically. Three things that improve the most, as I said, is the um, the tremors, and then those who have the stiffness or fluctuations, and then the dyskinesias. And the way we tell our patients is that think of your best response that you get on the levodopa, just getting the response more consistently throughout the day, minus the dyskinesia, minus the tremor. That's usually what most of that's what the response is in most of the patients. Dr. Uh, Lotia, uh, there's a question here. So this is mainly for motor issues, not so much for memory or hallucinations. That is very much correct. It is primarily to treat the motor symptoms. Uh, it does not have any direct effect um, on hallucinations. Um, on memory, there is no improvement. Uh, in fact, we do tend to track uh, the cognitive changes uh, you know, over long term. And does it uh, cause uh, any, what, what are the risk factors of brain surgery? Of course, of course. Big concern for most people. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, the good thing is that it's been available for more than a couple of decades. So we've had a chance to perfect it and plan it in a way. So it's a very involved process just because we want to make sure, one, we are selecting the right patient. And then two, uh, you have a team that is set up to uh, set up for your success. Uh, so generally, when all those uh, guidelines are met, the chances of um, you know complications are uh, usually less. So what we usually talk about is less than one percent chance of uh, bleeding type of stroke. Uh, typically, uh, because the lead is going through, you know, it, they go through a lot of vessels, but the surgeons make sure that they are minimizing that injury. Uh, but less than one percent chance usually of a bleeding type of stroke that may lead to a paralysis. Uh, one to three percent chance of infection. Again, it's a system we are creating multiple incisions and the wounds take a while to heal. Uh, and, and some people at least, and in those individuals, there may be a higher risk of uh, infection. Those are the main issues. Um, sometimes we do talk about uh, side effects related to the stimulation. Uh, but again, with the advancing technologies, we are able to minimize the side effects related to the stimulation. Uh, what advice do you give to patients who are really hesitant about DBS? The biggest advice actually I give it to them is talking to another patient who has gone through that surgery because, you know, we have all the data. We can talk about what the outcomes may look like and, you know, we are able to most of the times get to those outcomes. But at the end of the day, it is the experience also that is scary. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, that's something that you can only relate to when you talk to someone who's gone through that process. Okay, we're going to come back to you. This seems like a good time to jump off and talk to one of those patients. Ed McQuaid, uh, been living with Parkinson since 2018 and recently underwent DBS surgery. Ed, uh, what considerations did you take into account in choosing DBS? Uh, first of all, I, I have been diagnosed with Parkinson's since 2018, but my sister my younger sister had it about six or eight years before me, and my mother had it. So I've been sort of exposed to Parkinson's since 20-something years, 25, 30 years. In fact, my mother died before the FDA approved DBS surgery. 
And then my sister uh, actually had it about eight years ago, I think, maybe more. So, and I am probably category two of um, you just heard, which is in 2018, I went to my doctor, told him I had Parkinson's, my PC, my primary care. And uh, he goes, well, what do you mean? You're in good health. I said, no, I have Parkinson's. He goes, he goes get up, walk, walk down the hallway. He goes, hey, you might. And then, um, I went to a neurologist and went through the same thing. And he said, yeah, you got it. He sent me for a test. Um, from there, that was May of 2018. And I have uh, progressed along. Probably, I thought maybe slowly at first, but it excel started accelerating. And when I say that, I just started taking more and more pills. I'm at the point now, I was at the point I was taking eight, eight to 10 pills a day. My whole life, my wife, my uh, 40 something, 45 years actually. And I, I, our life revolved around the timing of my medication. You know, you want to go out to dinner, what time are you going to have dinner? And if you wanted to have it an hour earlier without telling me, that was a problem because I had to take my pills, you know. Before dinner, I had to wait two hours and stuff like that. But, and I started uh, the first three to four years, I, my, one of my major activities in retirement has been golf. And I, I thought golf was a pretty good exercise for helping maybe even slow down the progression. And I swung a lot more than most people because I stink at it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but I kept going, and my doctor would say, yeah, or my, my neurologist, I should say, would say, oh, why don't you try rock steady boxing? And I wasn't ready for that yet. It made, I said, I don't think I need it yet. And about, about um, 2022, late 2022, I said, you know what, I'm going to try it this. So I could just tell I was getting more and more pills. I actually used to take extra pills to play golf. You know, I, I was officially on eight, but if I was going to play golf, when I started off, I was taking maybe an extra half a pill to play golf because it would keep me loose. Mm -hmm. By uh, 2022, I was taking one. And by 2024, I was taking two. Oh. One to start extra. Now this is extra. I mean, right. almost like one to start, and then <laughs> one about halfway through. And if I forgot to take it, there's one one friend I play with that yells over, "Ed, take your pill." <laughs> I take the pill, and you know, get back to hitting the ball a little better. But even my, my friends could tell I needed those pills. So it's rigidity and, and, and yeah, rigidity. pretty kinesia. Yeah. So I started to take, so I said to my wife, maybe it's time we, we, and I say we, because it, 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 it's not my journey. It's my wife's journey with me. It's my kids, whatever, kids, adult children. I said, okay, I think I need to go to DBS. And that, that was, uh, about December of 2023. I had an appointment, quarterly appointment with my neurologist in January. After he did what he did and wanted to talk about, I said, hey, what do you think the next steps will be? I, I, as I told you, I'm taking more pills and all. And he goes, well, I think you'd be a good candidate for DBS eventually. I said, well, why not now? He goes, oh. You want to go now and do it? I said, yeah, I'm 69 years old. Yeah, if I wait three or four more years, I'm going to end up being worse. I don't know how much it will help me, but, you know, I'll be three or four years old even if it helps me. It's okay. I, I know this great surgeon I know in town. It's, and uh, let me see if I can get an appointment with you and set him up. 
So he called, he set me up. I had to go have a MRI again. And then uh, I think in February, I met this neurosurgeon out of Lee Health. And uh, my wife and I spent an hour with him, which I is the most time I've ever spent with a doctor in my life. <laughs> we probably had more information shared than many meetings. And uh, he was great. He answered every question I had. He explained the three different, he explained what the doctor just explained. He explained uh, a little bit about the differences between the three technologies. And he explained that Abbott had the smallest battery and it was rechargeable. And I like that idea. He explained, um, that they had they worked with you gave you an iPhone it was on you know, your control was on the phone it was an app I said, well I'm not a big Apple user but I'm a big Google user but I didn't care and then he explained about this uh, process where you if you have a problem you can go on the internet and if you can't get back to the doctor they can do it over the internet give you you know a clinic over the internet. I thought that was fantastic. And that's, you know, so then he explained I had to go have a um, few more tests before he, he could decide whether I was a good candidate. And I went and had a uh, cognitive exam that they said would take maybe two or three hours. It took me three to four. It was really why it would have took me longer. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I found out later that taking longer was, Part of that was because my cognition was good enough. They just keep going until they find out on certain tests where it is. Right. So it takes longer. So I said, oh, okay. I didn't fail then. No, yeah, I actually passed. With, uh, Do you have any reservations about the surgery leading up to it? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a financial guy. And I like to think about, and I'm also introverted, I, I like to think about the low end and the high end and what can happen. And I decided to discuss with my wife about, well, what happens when I become a vegetable? They're on my brain. She goes, stop worrying, <laughs> basically. And she she was very supportive. And when I talked about the low and the high. What's the best I can expect? What's the least? You mitigate the risk. Think about it, mitigate it. And once you make the decision, you go forward. I so I um that was it. And the doctor was right. I take this kit with me when I go out to uh a cruise or something. And I I I actually charge my battery about once a week. But I could charge it more than that. It's simple. Here it is. That's the wireless proof. So you wireless. beep it or you can explode or that's not me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can just go like this. Wait three seconds. And adjust it. My part, my uh, little battery is right here. Please mute if you are not part of the uh, presentation. Okay, the beeping was me that time. That's the beeping that says I, I I'm over the battery. And you can uh, you can probably see the blinking yep. light. That blink light says it's working, and I'm charging right now. That's how simple it is. Wow. And, you know, I do this every Sunday night about 8 o'clock. have my phone go off, tell me it's time to charge my battery. Now, the marketing people tell you it's like, you know, you can last four weeks or something. I do it every week as part of routine, and that's my whole pocket. And, Right now, I don't take any pills anymore. I go on from 10 pills to zero. I nice. do this once a week. 
And then when the battery charged, and, and you know, the iPhone, when the battery's charged up, and it's probably a bit charged, I did that so that you could hear the beep and everything. Uh, Do you have a new lease on life? Oh, life is after post and pre and post surgery is phenomenal. Like I say, I was in that second category the doctor mentioned. I started, oh, I'm going to just turn this off. Oh, no, I'll just move it off for a minute to show you something. And um, I had um, started, that's telling me there's a problem. Does it not over my. Just, uh, just turn it off, Ed. Just, just power it down. Just turn it off. Yep. So I go out and um, I started having um, a walker at night because my wife was afraid. I was going to fall at night because I was up all night before surgery. I mean, I, I, I some days, some nights, I, I'd be up till seven in the morning when my wife got up. Yep. I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't lie down on the bed. I couldn't turn. I, 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 was, I just couldn't do it. Now I sleep like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 the greatest thing. But I sleep like a kid again. I. I get up, I can dress myself. I can yeah. button shirts. I can say, okay, Jane, let's go. You're holding me up to go to dinner where I used to hold her up and say, if you want to get out, you got to button this shirt for me. Simple things like that. The things that you used to do that were everyday movements, life, they're all coming back. That's great. And I I uh, I'm amazed uh, how lucky I've been with the surgery. Well, I, I'm a lot like you, and I was probably in that second category as well. I was taking 21 pills a day, and so it really disrupted my life. Yeah. Um, and I'm down to a half a pill in the morning and a half a pill at night. Great. And it's yeah. it's fantastic. And it, your whole attitude changes. You can do things. I'm a, yeah. I'm still stinking at golf, but I'm getting there. Well, so you're back to normal. That's okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. More gonna, than normal. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Margaret Cohn now. I just have I just have a quick question for both of you, maybe uh, maybe Larry and Ed. Maybe you could uh, we could use your uh, pattern of your hair to show what it looks like <laughs> to have uh, because often people ask us that question. Sure, Am I gonna right? grow horns or something? Can you can you show us? <laughs> So I've got one badge of honor right there. Two devil horns. The horns of plenty. Yeah. And then I got one over here. So, so, so far you're not growing antennas. You're not uh, uh, talking to aliens or anything like that yet. <laughs> not, <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> We're working on it. Maybe I'll have to grow a little more. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be the breakthrough for the sci fi channel. Whenever. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Margaret, who was diagnosed in 2015 and had DBS surgery also earlier this year. Margaret, love to hear about your journey and how you've adjusted to post-life, post-surgery. Absolutely. Um, I, I do want to say that I always look at what a solution is or what can that, what solution can we work towards. I was diagnosed in a, probably a, the strangest manner. I was diagnosed by my neurologist, obviously, Dr. Issa, and uh, he said quite plainly, Margaret, yes, you've got Parkinson's. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, well, you're taking this very well. And I said, well, you know, I've got it, so I need to do something about it. You know, when you've got something, you've got to find the solutions, how to counteract that. So after a while, I was thinking about okay what's gonna go first with me i'm a very active person i travel a lot i don't really want to change my lifestyle i want to have the same quality of life that i've always had knew that i couldn't down the road and that i would have some obstacles to overcome so i started thinking about it and i thought you know parkinson's just takes everything away from you but it doesn't take it away all in one shot it takes it away when it wants to take it away. It has no, it's not going to send you a planner. It's not going to send you a schedule. It's going to 
you're going to get up one day and find that walking is a little bit more difficult. And in my case, that was important to me because I played tennis. Um, I swam a lot. So I wanted to make sure that my my body was strong enough to maintain the the quality of life that I had. So I thought, okay, my legs are going to go first. I'm going to find it hard. My muscles are going to get exhausted. So what do I do about that? What I did was I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, not once, wow. but twice. And so I called this the arithmetic of my new life. Whenever it took something away from me, I counteracted with putting a plus back in. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, it took away my speech. And coming and at that time, I was still working in corporate America. I found that my presentations weren't as sharp and I would mix words up and I couldn't pronounce some words. So I thought, you know, we have a problem here. I want to continue working at the rate that I'm working. I don't want to stop giving presentations. I don't want to stop um, talking about my job and interviewing people. Mm -hmm. So I decided to um, open up a podcast because that way I had to talk. Mm -hmm. So what I do is, you know, people will tell me, will, will tell me, because I couldn't tie my shoelaces. So people will tell, well, these, these shoelaces, there's these shoes that have Velcro. I go, no. I have to maintain the function of my, I don't care how long it takes, I've got to maintain the function of tying a shoelace. So I would sit there, right here I can re recommend that you have a dog, because my dog, well it's not my dog, it's my daughter's dog who I watched during the day, he would sit patiently just watching me try and tie the shoelace. But you know what, it kept my mind focused on not tying the shoelace, but actually going for the run that I was going to go for. But I had to tie my shoelaces. So it took that stress off of the, oh, I can't do this. Eventually I got it done. The same with um, art. I only became an artist when I was two years into my diagnosis. Wow. And there is something incredible. There's a connection between art and music and Parkinson's. It, it can, I can go, I forget to take my medication because it just somehow stimulates that part of your brain that causes the dopamine flux to happen. Um, and it, I, I mean, I, I paint every night. It was the only way I could get through a night was to paint. Um, so I, I know I've spoken to Dr. Latte about this, about the connection. Um, I don't know clinically what happens. But I do know that I could not do small paintings because of my tremors and which were getting worse. So I thought, you know what, I can't do this, but I'm not going to stop painting because it is doing something for me. It is, it is allowing me to live through this moment or these moments. It, is, turns, it turns the off switch on just automatically. So I decided to create large canvases. So now I do eight eight feet by eight feet 12 feet by 12 feet because it gives you that flow of your hand and it's it's actually quite cathartic um, I found I was sleeping better after I painted for a while I found out my my memory sort of kept um, above average by painting so there is a connection and I do recommend to people you don't have to be an artist I am I, I could not draw that tree out there but I can do um, but I can paint <laughs> Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is thinking about what it's going to take away from you next. And you own this. I own this. My, my significant other does not own this. My children don't own this. I own this disease. They, they are there to support me. Um, I did write something I think will explain the life of DBS before and the life of DBS afterwards. Sure. And I wrote, imagine what it must feel like actually to sit still, hold a book, turn a page, and be still. Imagine what it must feel like to tie your shoelaces and go for a walk. Imagine what it must feel like to hold a fork and put food on it, take it up to your mouth. 
and actually eat it. Imagine what it must feel like to put makeup on, especially the brows. Imagine what it must feel like to say yes to an invitation to the opera and to be able to sit still through the entire production. Imagine what it must feel like to do all these things that were not available. Imagine what it must feel like to not have to put the burden on somebody else. Lovely. Anyway, oh, I do want to, to I hope you don't mind, the, uh, somebody wrote in and, and mentioned their memory. Yeah. Although the DBS system does not help your memory, I found that by doing something uh, and by the DBS, because it takes away, my job for 10 years was taking care of my Parkinson's. I've now been promoted to being an advocate and the device is now doing my job. It took my job, that job away from me, which I owned for 10 years. And then I got the promotion and became an advocate. Nice. For it. So well, it has helped my memory. It's kept my memory where it should be. Is for, you know, I forget people's names, I, but that, I can put that to my age. Um, and then another lady wrote in about interviewing a surgeon. You've, you've got to have the right team in place. You've got to know, you've got to feel comfortable with the surgeons, with your team. And I'm very lucky. I've got an amazing, amazing team. Uh, so when you were preparing for DBS, did you have any reservations? No, none. No, and I'll tell you why. I didn't have, I, I, I kept thinking about that question. You can come up with one, one concern. I, I didn't have a concern because I felt comfortable with my surgeon. I felt going into this, you know, if something went wrong, I know that this man that is giving me a better life, if something went wrong, he would use me to better somebody else's life. So that was a comfort going into the surgery. Plus Abbott have an amazing team of navigators. And, and Barbara, my navigator, was with me as I was being wheeled in through the whole process, and she was the first one there after my surgery. Um, so, no, I, I, I didn't. Can you highlight some of the, um, some of the independence that you uh, attained through the DBS? Um, I can tie my shoelaces. I can eat. Um, I can actually uh, put food on a fork and take it up to my mouth without hesitation. Um, I sleep better at night. Um, I'm not um, I'm I'm not beholden to, to medication. Mm -hmm. um, it's the quality of my life I have back. It's That's it's cool. it truly is incredible. Yeah, it's it's it, until you experience it, it's really hard to imagine it possible. Mm -hmm. When you're in that state before DBS, and you're shoveling pills down and you're trying to figure out like, what's going on with your body. And <laughs> every day you wake up with another pain and you wonder if it's just today or or if it's forever. And Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, the, the worst thing without the DBS, I would get dyskinesia to the point where I would have to lie on the floor and and cry and scream and mm -hmm. just. So it, somewhere along the line, it would disconnect and turn my switch on. I would go through like a 20 minute. It's like you said, if you don't experience it, you have no idea what that pain is like. It's, I've broken bones. I've had surgeries. I've um, you know, had some awful things happen to me, but there's nothing like the pain with dyskinesia. Yeah. And there's some oftentimes some unexpected or unpredictable things that can happen during DBS as far as what it will help. Like I had yeah. uh, I, I, I had uh, um, <clears throat> sharp pains that went down into my feet and uh, whatnot uh, that were not related to Parkinson's, but they, they're gone now. So <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Dr. Lodio, somebody asked, what should they, when they interview their surgeon, what should they be asking? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, very good question. Um, there are a lot of questions you want to ask. Uh, so, of course, uh, do your research. So, 
uh, we always say that uh, experience matters in this. So when you're going to a surgeon, make sure that they are equipped to do the surgery. So they've done quite a few or at least a few to be able to offer that. That's the number one question. Um, second question is um, how do they do the surgeries as well? Like there are some centers where they do one lead and then they come back and do the other side. And there are some like us, we do both the leads at the same time. Um, Third, of course, the question comes is uh, what what device or what company to use? Generally, uh, you want to have that open discussion that that one system is not necessarily married to just one device or one company. There are three companies. Uh, we primarily use Abbott uh, for uh, two reasons. One is um, that it has the virtual capability. That's the only system right now that can offer you virtual programming, so you can be anywhere in the world and we could program you uh, if needed um, and uh, obviously the rechargeable battery that is new but to us it's the um, entire support system as margaret said like we have a wonderful support system that comes through the Abbott team that is scientifically backed uh, with everything that we do but uh, having said that going back to your surgeon uh, you need to be able to have that discussion that you can you're at least involved in that discussion as to what device will you use and then secondly uh, or thirdly, uh, you know, what are their complication rates? Uh, every surgeon should be able to track their own. They will tell you a national average, uh, but then there has to be a way to be able to tell them what their complication rates have been and how have they managed them. At least those are bare minimums is what I would say. There is more to it, but at least yeah. this is bare minimum. Uh, quick aside, you were talking about the remote program. You know, I had a friend of mine who was on top of a ski hill and was getting reprogrammed because it wasn't something was off. And he got <laughs> programmed at the top of a ski hill. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Um, what are some of the common mis misconceptions about DBS? You know what? The biggest one I want to tell everyone. Um, you know, and it's no one's fault. Back in the days when the indications came out. It, people used to write, uh, it is for advanced Parkinson's. Everyone's definition of advanced is different, um, but um, there is a window and I want you to know that. And DBS by no means should be kept as a last resort. It should always be discussed as your treatment paradigm right from the beginning. But again, it's not something I talk about when I'm diagnosing somebody with Parkinson's. But as we start discussing more medication, increasing the dose, adjusting the medication, that discussion needs to start happening at that point. And it has to be a personalized decision. It really is quality of life and only you know your quality of life. And that has to be discussed with your doctor every time. And that discussion should happen. So that's number one thing that I always tell that this is not a last resort. You don't have to be really bad to do the DBS. In fact, you want to actually get it done before before you start declining so you can still enjoy some good quality time as we've heard from all the wonderful speakers here today. Um, often we hear about uh, the memory problems and the speech problems. Um, often patients feel like, oh, they might get demented. That's that's not true. Um, you know, there is some evidence of uh, slower cognitive decline over many, many years, but generally short term data as of now, we don't have any evidence that there is a decline short term. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we sort of think about which patient should be selected for these surgeries. Also, um, uh, we also try to clarify what symptoms will not get better. Uh, typically, again, memory issues don't get better. Speech issues do not get better. Balance uh, is an interesting discussion. Again, if the balance gets better with the medications, uh, by letting the medications work more effectively, the DBS will indirectly help the balance. But if you have other reasons for having balance issues, you know, many of patients who have arthritis, neuropathy, some other reason for having balance issues, of course, don't won't get better with the DBS. Uh, and that has to be discussed. Um, I always cringe when I uh, when I see someone who says I'm on no medication after the DBS. Uh, there are still things that the medications can do. Uh, that the DPS doesn't. So we always say that, yes, there is overall reduction in the medication, but it's not that you'll be completely off for a long, long period of time. So all those are some simple things that we need to help clarify. Well, and it I kind of resets you, right? So, so, you, so you're, you're gonna, you're still gonna advance. You're just gonna advance from a different 
place. So like you're you're probably going to be adding medications throughout your journey. Right. And then as I said, there is more to the levodopa than just it helping the the tremors or the balance. There are more things that the levodopa does to everybody, and everybody is different. So some people may still end up using it back at some point. Um, and I think somebody was asking if the sense of smell comes back. The answer is no. The sense of smell doesn't come back. Um, the smell the comes back. Uh, from from the DBS. No, the yeah. census does not come back from the DBS. And the internal shakes, uh, that's another interesting aspect. It's actually come up more often uh, that many, many patients who say, oh, I don't have visible tremors, but I feel the shakiness from within. And uh, of course, uh, levodopa actually helps with that. But uh, we've heard that again in patients who have that, that DBS has helped. I cannot tell you if there is you know, evidence on that, but it's anecdotally, we've heard from many patients that that internal feeling of shakiness does get better as well. And again, any of you, if you have experienced that, you can. Uh, uh, yeah, that. anecdotally, it's mine went away. Yeah, it was great. Uh, are there any uh, age parameters? Like, is somebody too old or too young to get DBS? Um, let me give. Let me put it this way: uh, Our younger patient with Parkinson who had the DBS is forty-three year old. And our oldest patient with Parkinson's who's getting the surgery is in their 80s. Wow. Great. So at the, basically, it depends on how your overall health is and, again, what the expectations are. And then how do you reassure patients who worry that DBS might affect their personality? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so there is some literature that talks about that certain... Um, programming may affect uh, a personality. It doesn't change it. Uh, it. Some what we call apathy or lack of motivation has been reported in very few set of patients. But with the advent of the newer technologies in the lead, we call it as a directional lead. So what a directional lead means, let me see if I can show you. Um, I'm going to pull this again. So this is a lead. And as you can see here, I'm going to give it a minute to settle down. Okay, you see the these four serrations there, yeah. and basically they used to be this sphere. Uh, so you would kind of when you would stimulate initially, you would create a, a kind of a balloon shaped, uh, um, you know, field around that stimulation. So if you had excessive stimulation, then that would uh, you know leak into the other areas, and that's what would cause sometimes the side effects. But what directional leads what they have done is instead of a full ring they've cut into three pieces. So then that allows us to give a stimulation to only a certain area and we can direct the current as to where it should go. And we are able to minimize some of those side effects. Um, actually, just two days ago, we had someone who after previous programming, they felt that they were not talking as much. It was not like they had speech problems, but they were just sort of less motivated to talk. And we just moved around their simulation and there was a quick change uh, as such. So again, uh, the, these days we are able to go over that. The directional leads are really great because I know for, in my instance, I was like, I get up from a chair and it's like I was being shot out of a rocket. And I was like, this is not right. I shouldn't be running across the room. And they just made one tweak and I, I'm back to like walking normal. And <laughs> and so it's a, just those little, little tweaks make all the difference. Larry, can I say something? Oh, for sure. Um, I've had quite a lot of people ask me, does the, does the device in my chest and the cords that go up to my brain, does that not prohibit me from joining in a sport or do I have to, basically, do I have to be careful not to use my right side just in case this thing comes out and the leads go away? I do everything and probably more than I, than I did when I had uh, Parkinson's for those 10 years. Um, I, I swim. I don't even know this thing is there. I swim. Um, I play tennis and I'm right handed. It, for those of you who wonder if it's going to slip and fall out, uh, you forget it's even there. I don't know about you, Larry, and you, Ed. Yeah, I forget it's there too. Yeah. Uh, I so, agree. Yeah, no, until I feel something in my head and I feel the cords. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then I'll, I'll follow the cords down. Oh, that's the other thing is people think that maybe the cords are outside. No, folks, they're inside. You they're, can't, they're inside. Yeah. And I still get massage like and everything else. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you know that it's the wires are very kind of stretchy, bendy, and so you know they move around very well as such. So to to their point, it's it's not going to fix your neck in a certain. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I want to make sure that people get their questions in. So uh, the last 10 minutes, we're going to take uh, audience questions. So feel free to write those in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to to uh, to get from each of you, Ed and Margaret, and then we'll go to Dr. Uh, Lodia. Ed and Margaret, what is one thing that you thought uh, that's gone forever that you're able to do now? Oh, God. Eat. <laughs> yeah, like eat feed yeah. yourself, right? <laughs> Wait, you that, that, I said living. Living. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always, I would, as, as all if, the simple things. All the yeah, simple. we were not diagnosed. We were not given a death a death diagnosis. You know, so why not live life? Yeah, it's great. I, uh, I actually, I thought I'd never be able to walk and hold my wife's hand at the same time and have a conversation with her because there's too many things at once. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I can do that now, which is great. Um, Dr. Uh, one, one uh, thing Lord, I've go ahead, Ed. Oh, one thing I've noticed is, and I was listening to the, um, I'll call it poem, the Margaret Oldham, which I can sit. I can sit in an airplane seat for three or four hours now. I can go on cruises with my wife and be comfortable no matter what we're doing, getting on the boat, off the boat, having dinner. I played, we went on the cruise recently. I played cards with my friends and I actually shuffled and dealt. Wow. I haven't done that for about a year and a half. That's great. When I get back to Florida next week, they're going to be once or once in two weeks we play, I don't know, hand, knee, and foot. The last year and a half, everyone, eight of us get together at night, nine of us, whatever, eight. Next guy's going to be shuffling the deck. I can't sure. take time, turn shuffling for me, dealing for me, because I couldn't do it. No. Now, it's things like that. It's just, it's like little things. Yeah. Little things. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lodia, um, I know one of the things that I was hesitant about going into my surgery was, well, what if something better comes along? Like, what, 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 what if stem cells finally pass or whatever? And um, what do you say to people who are hesitant because they're like they don't want to miss out? You know, interestingly, this is a very common question, Larry, especially those who are very well informed and who are so involved in the decision making. So uh, yes, the technology is moving along and um, it has you know, changed drastically even just in the last eight years or so. Um, so if I just were to talk about advances within the DBS, uh, you know, things have changed very well uh, with a lot of their companies, especially with Abbott, uh, the newer rechargeable device is sort of upgrade eligible. So a lot of the updates that may happen over the next few years, uh, they can push it through the software. Uh, so even though you have a battery, they can still upgrade those uh, for the most part. However, again, if something changes in the lead, then of course that's a different thing. But to date, I'm yet to see someone who we took back for the surgery because we had a newer or more fancier lead. Um, so that should not uh, keep you away from doing the surgery now. Uh, also, as we all understand science and we all understand how long it takes for the research to come through, um, you know, it will take at least good three to five years for any newer treatment that is going to change your life uh, forever. It's going to take a while, but in that time, you're losing valuable time. Uh, and we do talk about, in a way, a reversibility of the DBS that if there is something that we can always turn it off, I'm yet to come across a patient where we actually had to um, remove the system for uh, for because they did not like something about it. Uh, but you just can turn it off and you can still be eligible for a lot of things. So, I well, do not... and, and you can layer in like things on top of it too. It's not, it's right. not one or the other. Yeah. The, the, in fact, even in the clinical trial world, we are discussing this sometimes when the newer medications are coming out and people want to participate in clinical trials. If they have DBS, some of them sometimes are excluded 
but actually even that is being changed right now that just because they had a DBS, why are we not letting them be part of it? So that's also changing over time. But the point is that you have this therapy that is already approved for all these years. We have 20 years worth of data showing that it helps improve the quality of life. And we are only getting older, whether you have Parkinson's or not, we are only losing time. Why not <laughs> do something that already is available and worry about what's out there in the future? That's my answer. Great, great. Yeah, it's great. We we have a question here. Has any uh, DBS patients resolved gut issues or constipation? I haven't. No. <laughs> you guys have. No. No, no. DBS didn't help that at all. Well, prunes and prune juice do. I agree. <laughs> I think somebody was asking me if they could take uh, Apokin after the surgery. Uh, so for those who may not know, uh, apokin is uh, one of the uh, adjunct of the levodopa. Sometimes we use it to help uh, treat some of the Parkinson's symptoms, including off states. Uh, you can use any medications uh, after the DBS. Uh, again, the overall goal is that uh, there is overall reduction in the medication. Sometimes people use apokin as a rescue measure. So the whole point is that if you get DBS, then likely you will, less likely that you will need those rescue medications. So hopefully they don't need it again none of my patients are on apokin so uh, but it doesn't you know exclude you from not getting apokin just because you had a dbs surgery somebody else nobody... was asking about the hair shaving yeah. and uh i know the surgeons at least uh, the surgeons i know would like to do it themselves and have you do it and they're not good at it i agree we just <laughs> talked about that uh, that uh, unfortunately they did not train them for uh, for hair cutting in the medical school or residency, uh, but um, uh, yes, we uh, most of the centers at this point shave a complete head. There are some centers where, especially in women, where they actually kind of create a small incision just around it. Uh, but because of the infection control and such, it's almost you know most of the centers at this point tend to uh, shave the head. Yeah, this says here you may be a questionable barber. <laughs> that, is, that, that person is uh, unfortunately working with us. No, uh, Nigam <laughs> is our nurse, uh, amazing nurse practitioner. Uh, so he he does tend to put jokes on the side. So that's good. That's good. Margaret, did you have uh, something to add? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Other than um, you know, you, what your gut's going to tell you is what the next step is. And I will tell you, once you have uh, spoken to your your surgeon or your neurologist, go for it. I mean, there, there really is no downside to it. And I know it's different for everybody, um, but at least look at it. At least and, make it a consideration. And, and there's, there's there is device. time after the surgery that you have to wait to turn on the device and then you have to yeah get it tweaked, and then you have to go back in and get it tweaked again. It's a process. Yes. So it's not going to be instant, and it's not going to be a miracle, but it's going to, like, a year, I'm a year out. Yeah. Last October, I had my surgery, and I feel great. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, yeah. So, so two points to both of yours to just cap off. So for Margaret's point, so just because you got a pre DBS evaluation, wherever you are at our, we have a comprehensive evaluation. You see uh, us, the PT, OT speech, uh, you get MRI, you meet the neurosurgeon and neuropsychological evaluation and our nurse navigator who does all this awesome job of coordinating all this together. Uh, but just because you went through this whole comprehensive evaluation, and even if you're a candidate, it doesn't mean you have to do the surgery. It just tells you where you stand in your Parkinson's mm -hmm. journey. Uh, but at least it gives you a chance to, uh, for you to understand whether you're a candidate or not. And uh, based on the expectations you discuss, then you can go in and say, okay, yes or no for that. So to point to Margaret's point, that's the way to consider it for the surgery. And then to Larry's point, uh, even from the time you say you want to do the surgery to the time you actually get the benefits, average time is four to six months. Yeah. So that's that process that we talked about. So it's not immediate and it's not like today you had a discussion with your neurologist and tomorrow you're getting surgery and the day after you'll be running a marathon uh, but that's the point is uh, it's I'd, time to be. I'd also like to point out use your navig uh, your volunteers that you have um, ambassadors um, you know get their names call them up the more information you get the more comfortable you're going to feel 
Um, and you have to have this comfort zone to go into this process. Because as you say, you're not going to get the, when you come out of surgery, it's not going to be, ha ha, it's done. It's, it's, it's a process, but it's a great journey. Well, one of the things that my surgeon uh, suggested is, he said, think about right now what you're going to do after the surgery when you have these capabilities back. Like, don't just keep living the way you've been living. Yeah. You've got to figure out what it is. What are you looking forward to doing yeah. with your new body, as it were? Uh, and that was really helpful. Uh, the other thing is, um, I, I find somebody was asking about, uh, with all the good stuff about DBS, and I, I can tell you, I'm driving again where I wasn't before. I'm uh, <clears throat> I have spending more time with my 15 year old son and with my wife. I'm not as anxious going out into crowds. Um, I, I mean, there's so many little things that I can do now. I, I'm not falling <laughs> anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just great to, to be able to, to live a life and not feel like I'm trying to maneuver through somebody yeah. else's body. Mm -hmm. amazing. amazing to hear that, Larry. So I've been doing this for 10 years. And as long as I can say, yes, I we know the literature, we know about this, I still don't know as an as a patient, as an experience. So I do try to ask this to every patient. I know it's unfair, but I still still ask, if you were to describe this in two words, how would you describe your surgical experience? It's just for me to know so I can kind of counsel the patients. And I hear very different words from incredible to, you know, exciting to entertaining. Two people so far have told me it was a piece of cake. I'm not sure if I want to say that, uh, but still, uh, you know, they've said that. But the most common word I always hear from them is, I don't know what the fuss was all about. Um, because, you know, of course it's scary, it's a brain surgery, but as I said, it's, 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 it has had its time to perfect itself over and <clears throat> over. And the team usually, wherever you go, is very well equipped to handle this. And even you are even if you're awake through the surgery, they, they help you keep yourself comfortable with it. So that's the point. <clears throat> great, that's great. Well, Ed, Margaret, and uh, Dr. Lodia, thank you for your time today. Uh, and mm -hmm. thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. Uh, throughout the session, we've heard firsthand how DBS can significantly improve the quality of life by offering greater control over daily symptoms. Uh, the Liberta RC system's proven to be a game changer with a small size and long battery life and remote programming capabilities, all of which make the DBS experience smoother and more manageable. If you're interested in learning more or speaking with a patient who has experienced DBS firsthand, visit lifewithdbs.com and explore the ambassador program for personalized support. Thank you all. Be well. For Abbott, I'm Larry Gifford.